Just some other interesting projects that I worked on there, and this goes back to using um, waste fuels. Um, electri in fact, for a university, Electroni in Lithuania, there were um, three sets of power stations, which were all designed by the Russians. Uh, Electroni has the sister nuclear power plant, Chernobyl. And when Lithuania joined the EU, the EU said, here is uh, a pot of money, shut them down, please, and demothball your conventional power plants. So we were asked to go in and look at these um, steam, to steam, basically, high-pressure steam, superheated steam um, furnaces. Uh, the, the boiler house was incredible. The floors were white-tiled, polished continually, in a power station that's burning heavy fuel oil, which is as dirty, if not dirtier, than coal. Uh, they had, because it's a tropical environment in there, despite it being minus 20 outside, they were fantastic pot plants. It's like a tropical greenhouse inside a power station. Um, but what was interesting there from a, an engineering point of view is the, each boiler was designed by a different academic in Moscow. And you could see their identities in there. So that the steam cycle was a theoretical steam cycle, which was then given to Lithuanian engineers to put into practice. And each of the four, well actually there were four turbines, eight furnaces, uh, each one was individual. And so for us being brought in um, 30 years down the line, we now have to change it from heavy fuel oil, which, never, which it never fired, to a Venezuelan oil called orimulsion, which is a mixture of heavy fuel oil and water. So it's emulsified. And it's opposed firing. So you've got burners, um, you've probably got, there were 10 megawatt burners and the furnace was uh, about four metres apart. So you're trying to do low NOx now, which is all about reducing your flame intensity, and you're firing these burners at each other, and the flames are meeting in the middle and going vertically up. It's everything you shouldn't do for NOx. It's everything you shouldn't do to get clean combustion. And uh, there were no, well, the only drawings that existed for the furnaces were hand drawings. And um, yes, it was quite a challenge. The, once we got the, the way in which we mix the boosted over fire and things like that ready, our biggest problem was the safety equipment. You, on each burner you have um, a UV sensor which detects flame. So if the burner goes out and is just pouring in fuel, you shut down the furnace because the last thing you want is that to suddenly ignite and it's a big bomb. Um, you put your um, UV sensor behind the flame, you look at the flame. But the problem is you're looking at the flame opposite too. So we ended up uh, putting a cooling rod in and almost looking actually back in the furnace itself to identify that flame. Um, but Electron I was a series of three power stations, uh, all demothballed, put back into service. They'd sat around for 30 years not doing anything. Um, all lagged with asbestos. EU asbestos requirements required us to take an inspector out there. So he went into the power stations, did his uh, ambient check, no, we're three times the limit. Out of interest in the hotel that evening, or rather out in the pub in a restaurant in uh, Vilnius, he went outside and did an ambient check in Vilnius. It's one and a half times the UK industrial spec, and that's just the ambient air within Lithuania. So we clean the, the, um, the boiler plant up to be below, but if you let fresh air in, you're, you're over EU regulations. Um, other, I was lead engineer on, on um, four other projects. Ineos Chlor up in Liverpool was very interesting. Uh, they produce chemicals. One of the byproducts of their process, of the chlorine process, is um, hydrogen. And hydrogen is a waste fuel to them. So they, they make their own power on sites. They've got uh, two 20 megawatt furnaces, each with 10 megawatt burners, burning hydrogen. The trouble with hydrogen when you're trying to commission it, it, it has no colour. There is no flame. So you, we lit it. It didn't go bang, fortunately. We didn't know what was in there. Um, got it going, but you can't see a flame, you don't know if you're impinging on the furnace. All you can do is shut it down and start to look at the boiler tubes and you start to see discoloration. You, you have to, using the head of the burner, um, but you have a diffuser which you can pull back and forth, which you make the, the flame longer, shorter, fatter, wider. You can change the shape of the flame. But because we can't see the flame, we don't know what shape we're doing. We just know efficiencies. So in that job, we ended up putting chlorine in it to give it a yellow tinge, so then we could see the flame shape and uh, commission it from there. Um, Khartoum North Power Station was an experience in many ways. Uh, it was built by the um, British, uh, Eubank priests were the consultants in the old colonial days. Um, in, again, Khartoum's under sanctions. 
The, a lot of spare parts come from America. America can't trade with Khartoum, so they have to come through the UK. Uh, and it's all Saudi money that funds it. Um, when I arrived there to commission it, we were doing a fuel change because they changed their refinery. We were firing a different grade of fuel, originally a heavier fuel going to a lighter distillate fuel. So it sent a representative out from Alstom to oversee the commissioning. I turned up at the airport with customs document with a burner gun. Now that's the description we use for a nozzle. Customs said, gun, we'll have that and we'll have you please. So that took a bit of explaining, eventually released and we get to the power station. Meet the uh, manager of the power station and he says, if this isn't on by the weekend, um, we'll not be alive. I laughed, he didn't. He was serious. Khartoum North, we did it in February. Um, air conditioning gets switched on after that. There are two power stations in Khartoum. Um, if they don't run, they've got nothing. And uh, I don't know how long station managers last there, but they were quite young. Um, we uh, were trying to get spare, but when you bring a turbine online, the, the, uh, the spinning turbine, you start up with barring gear, which is basically an electrical motor, you start it spinning, then you start bleeding the uh, steam in and you start to spin it up. Um, the bearings on the motor were duff. Um, we couldn't deal with America, we couldn't get any spare parts in, we had two days in which to do it. Um, eventually, uh, the African kicked in, uh, produced something, we got the turbine spinning to a fashion and uh, got it online. And to celebrate, got a goat, slit its throat, spilled the blood over the foundations of the power station, had a big feast in the control room. So we've got a modern control room with PLC controls and there's a big uh, basin on the table and everyone's helping themselves to the, the communal feast. Um, that's, that's the different cultures. It was a very interesting experience. Being from the Europe, I had turned up in full protective, uh, personal protective equipment, um, steel-toed boots, uh, full length, overalls, hard hat, ear defenders, eye goggles, everything. The face of that boiler was 72 degrees centigrade, and that's where I spent most of my time. The locals, flip-flops and shorts. That was it. Um, I think I lost a couple of stone just working there for a week. Uh, in the hotel we stayed in, the swimming pool was um, air-conditioned to cool it down because the ambience were about 45 degrees C. You jump in the pool, it was 35, it felt like a fridge. Over here it'd be a steaming bath. Um, Mijeki Nafta was in Lithuania. Uh, another very interesting job. It was um, an oil refinery. So we've got the cracking process, which is the viz breaker process, and you, you take the various distillates off and they all have a value. We get to the end of that process and you're left with um, a substance which, if allowed to cool below 250 degrees centigrade, turns into a Bakelite material, so rock solid. Working with um, some scientists in Berlin, we developed a way of maintaining the temperature of that fuel uh, or, or of that um, substance about 400 degrees centigrade. Then we could atomize it through a nor normal burner. So there, what was a waste product, we turned into a fuel and suddenly that just, um, power station or um, refining process became massively profitable. We then tried to take some of that fuel to America to test in our um, laboratories over there. And despite trying to keep it hot, it solidified um, somewhere over the Atlantic and we never actually managed to get any there. Um, Vasilikos power station, I mentioned that because two years ago it was blown up. Um, not because of me, but next door they had an arms dump. I don't know where the arms had come from, but for uh, some reason you might have seen it in the news, but that blew up and took out half the power station. So I feel sad that half my work went up in flames. Um, moving on to a bit of the UK strategy. And this is really what drives um, what we do in industry, is, is the way the government's leading us. Um, this is DEX heat strategy, although it's changing, so I learned in December. Originally, the big problem is carbon. We signed up the Kyoto Agreement. We want to be carbon neutral by 2050, certain targets by 2020. Um, heat is the single biggest reason we use energy in our society. We use more energy for heating than for transport or for the generation of electricity. This year, the UK will spend £33 billion on heat across its economy. We use heat to keep our homes and offices warm, we use energy to cool them in hot weather. Uh, we also use heat to provide us with hot water. Today, the mass, vast majority of our heat is produced by fossil fuels, which are carbon intensive. 80% of that is natural gas. Half of that natural gas we are now importing by tanker from the Middle East. So those prices are sh um, steeply going up. Government has decided this is unsustainable. So their 2011 carbon plan 
is to put most of the domestic heating onto electricity than to generate electricity with renewable means, co-firing of biomass, wind turbines, PV panels, um, CHPs, um, deep geothermal, various other ways of generating electricity from the green methods, and then to use such things as heat pumps to heat our home. Now, I sat with DEC in December, so we've had this policy since 2008. So we've had it for five, six years. Industry has moved forward. We are going to heat all of our homes using electricity generated from renewable sources. Fracking's arrived. Suddenly, the government decides fracking, it's gas, it's low carbon, it's clean. We're going to change this policy now. So this whole industry has moved forward. The dinosaur has gathered momentum. Now we've all got to put the brakes on stop and see what they're going to decide. So we're all waiting for what's going to be in the press. But the short term, this is the policy and probably most domestic properties will head towards using things like heat pumps. Um, here's a pie chart showing you the uh, energy use by fuel. 68 or well, nearly 69% is gas, 10% is oil, 3.3% is solid fuel. Uh, around here, a lot of the um, power stations were coal-fired. A lot of the staff that worked in the power stations as part of their tenancy were given free coal. So there's still a lot of people over towards Selby who have coal fires and back boilers within their properties still getting their free coal. Uh, then we move down to electricity. So a lot of people in electricity. Renewables represents 1.5% at present. They want to get that to 15% by uh, 2020. Um, the Renewable Heat Incentive, launched by the government in 2010. Um, key aspects, it's a world first. The government has spent a long time thinking about it, pontificating over it, and delayed the launch of it by two years. But it came in in 2011. It supports a range of technologies, including solid and gaseous biomass, so biodigesters, uh, wood, solar thermal, ground and air source heat pumps, on-site biogas, deep geothermal, uh, renewable CHP, energy from waste, and injection from biomethane into the grid. Um, there's a support for the industrial sector at the beginning of November 2011, uh, not-for-profit organisations, communities in Scotland, Wales and Ireland through the Renewable Heat Incentive. Um, a support for the households is coming later in what we call domestic renewable heat incentive. Initially this was going to be funded by the power generators, but they all up in arms, so £860 million was um, ring-fenced by the government as a, a finite pot to do this. The non-domestic sector, um, claimed by the owner of the system, uh, for, is for a 20-year period. Uh, tariff levels are being calculated to overcome the initial capital cost of it compared to conventional means. Now, we have the commercial RHI. It's here now. We've had it for two years. Um, it has been an interesting two years. Um, the tariffs given, probably on the next page, the main technologies that have been supported are ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, biomass with wood chip and biomass with pellets. Um, ground source heat pumps uh, uses an electric motor to drive a compressor, harvesting a low grade heat, increasing that to a high grade heat. The strengths are it's electricity, it comes out the wall. It's, it's a refined source of energy, it's controlled. Um, we've had it around, it's generated by uh, various sources. That same applies to air source heat pumps. Um, with ground source heat pumps, return on investments are somewhere, like, somewhere up to 20% now. Um, with biomass, it's the same. Biomass is chip or wood pellet. Um, we've discussed the sort of benefits and pros and cons of each. But this, uh, I think, is a January snapshot of the RHI to date. Um, who or what technology has taken it? If you look at the blue line at the bottom, uh, that's small biomass. Now the rates for small biomass, the government was giving you 8.7 pence per kilowatt hour for every kilowatt hour of, of heat that you generated with your biomass. It's costing you four pence. So the farmers went, well hey, I can make money here. It cost me four pence to, to generate the heat. The government's going to pay me nearly twice that. So all the farmers are out there heating their chicken sheds with all the doors open, all their barns with no doors on. 
it's, it's a crop to them, it's another way of generating income. So they have taken a huge amount of, of the um, RHI. Uh, if we look at the green at the top, that's heat pumps and there's some token, thermal, token solar thermal in there. These are actual figures, again from, I think they were a couple of weeks ago. So this is where we are. So solid biomass boilers, 2,033 accredited installations. Biogas, one. Uh, deep geothermal, none. The only hot rocks project we're doing is in Cornwall. Um, government's invested, I think, to the tune of 13 million so far. And um, they withdrew it last year because it was going nowhere. Uh, places like Austria have got it closer to the surface. Um, Iceland, it's there. It bubbles out of the surface. It, it, it's almost a free energy to them. Uh, municipal solid waste, no installations. Solar thermal, 82. Water source heat pumps, 8. And biomethane, 3. So you can see it's so biased towards biomass that it's taking something like 98% of the budget. Um, as with the feed-in tariff, the government has a defined pot of £860 million. They've developed this thing called digression. So they set their budget for a year, and as um, the technology starts to approach that budget limit, then they will taper back the tariff. So biomass on a medium scale was five and a half pence, it's now down to five pence. And as we see, the green is the actual um, where we are on the spend actually, and the blue is the budget. So medium commercial biomass has gone over the budget. So that's being pegged back quite aggressively. Now there's been momentum gathering to get to that point, and it's not going to be that easy to stop it. It's going to overrun it massively, going back to your question about biomass. There are councils out there wanting to do all their schools on biomass. Now if you're on mains gas, it costs you four and a half pence a kilowatt hour, maybe less on a commercial scale. If you buy pellets, it's going to cost you five and a half pence a kilowatt hour. So why on earth would a council put biomass into schools? They take the RHI, the school pays the fuel bill. Suddenly you've lumped a school with a 20% um, higher fuel bill. It's madness. But there are obviously some good salesmen out there ripping people off. Um, we look at large commercial biomass, hasn't really taken off. Small commercial heat pumps, their target was something like 50 million in the first two years. They've not even achieved a percentage of it. Large commercial heat pumps, um, I think we're only about 8% of that. Solar collectors, so the total, we've nearly hit the total of the spend for the first two years, and 98% of that is biomass. So, there was a consultation in September last year where the government goes out to industry and says, what do you think? How are we doing? These are our ideas, come back to us. So I think about 35 companies wrote back to them and various um, societies and uh, groups got together. We said, biomass is too generous, level the playing field, even the spend out. You want to use electricity as your heating source, however you're promoting biomass. So you're, doing, you're saying one thing and doing another. We said, bring biomass down, it's too generous. If you put a biomass boiler in, you're going to get a payback within three years. For the next 17 years, you are getting tens of thousands of pounds a year just for burning wood, for nothing. And that's all taxpayers' money. So we said, cut biomass and even it with heat pumps. So the government listened and they said, OK, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll double heat pumps. So now we run the risk that that 860 million is going to be spent incredibly quickly. We as an industry want to develop a sustainable and overused word, but we want an industry that is going to grow. It's a new technology. We need to train people. We need to bring people in. We need to understand how it works. We need to create the supply chains that develop that. We can't do that if this industry only has a four-year lifespan in it. So we've asked them to, to peg it down, to make it more sustainable, make it more long-lived. But no, they've doubled it. So suddenly there's going to be a big rush into heat pumps and that will go bananas. And the problem with that is, and it's the problem we're seeing with biomass, is everyone sees the quick win. If you're with PV, all that there, were, there were probably 10 PV companies doing PV before any tariffs. Uh, they were proper electrical engineers, designers, structural engineers. It was all done properly. It didn't really pay for itself. Companies were doing it for green credentials and things like that. The feed-in tariff came along. Suddenly, if you fit satellite dishes, you've got a ladder so you can get on a roof. So you are now a PV installer. Everyone got into it. And 
There are so many horror stories out there. The same is happening with biomass. The one about the schools, their fuel bills are now going up. Um, their, the biomass is far more complex feedstocks. I learned of uh, a company last week. It's a buying group, a farming buying group. They've gone, they've got together a whole group of farmers in the southwest. They've bought 140 biomass boilers for themselves to get a, a discounted rate. Now they put them in last year. This year, so some of those have only just gone in. They're taking them out. They're throwing them away. And they're buying a proper boiler, a decent boiler, with decent fuel feed mechanism. But because the RHI is so generous, they can afford to do that. Their original system had a three-year payback. They're, they're taking it out, doubling their capital costs, so we're now six-year payback. They've still got 14 years of making hay while the sun shines out of the taxpayers' money. So the government has changed the tariffs. They've upped the heat pumps. So we expect to see a bit more. Um, this is the economic argument that, that, that really says everything um, about what we're trying to do, or someone who's considering these technologies. The, if you're interested in the CO2, there are CO2 figures here. But what is most interesting to people is the cost per kilowatt hour, and not the cost of the fuel, but the actual useful cost. So taking into account about combustion performance, manufacturers quote 90% efficiency on burning biomass. It's probably more like 60 in reality. Um, gas boilers, oil boilers. But if we take cost per useful kilowatt hour, our most expensive fuel is LPG. Um, it costs us about 10 pence per kilowatt hour. You get no RHI with it. Electricity on an industrial scale is about 9.5 pence per kilowatt hour, 14.5 if, if you're domestic, no RHI. Oil boilers, 7.5 pence per useful kilowatt hour. Uh, mains gas, 4 pence per kilowatt hour. These are all industrial rates, so commercial rates for buying in volume. Now we look at pellet, wood pellet, 5 pence per kilowatt hour. Gas, 4 pence per kilowatt hour. Why would you do it? Wood chip, 4.5 pence per kilowatt hour. Why would you bring in wood chips, um, suffer all the moisture content issues, uh, lowering output, etc., when it actually costs more than gas? Because the RHI is so generous. Air source heat pumps have, have, will be included as from April. Um, their effective rate is 3.16 pence per kilowatt hour, um, heating a, a relatively efficient building. Um, and you get RHI. And ground source heat pump sitting at the bottom with a decent uh, efficiency is about 2.37 pence per kilowatt hour. And you get the RHI on top of that, 8.7 pence. So the economic argument is changing, uh, moving in favour of uh, heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. It, I did an exercise last year for an estate which said, right, we want to embrace renewables. We have a heating bill of £47,000 a year. What can we do? We have 10,000 acres. We've got 2,000 acres of woodland. So we have our own biomass. So he says to me, I've got free biomass. Actually, it's not free. It has a value. And it also costs him to harvest it and process it. So we did the exercise. So on the left, we see biomass, cash flow over a 20-year period. The capital cost of biomass is cheaper to put the plant in, £346,000. His return on investment was 19%. So over 20 years, he gets 1.68 million from fuel saving and from RHI. Fantastic investment. Now we look at heat pumps. Most of the time heat pumps are discarded. The capital cost is higher, 489,000 pounds. But the return on investment over 20 years is 23%. And for in, if you invest nearly half a million pounds, you get 2.7 million back. So that gives you an idea on a larger scale what the opportunities are out there within the RHI and fuel savings. I don't know if anyone's got any questions on government incentives and things like that before I move on to a bit of the smaller level biomass. Well, that air source heat pump is ridiculous, isn't it? Because the maximum efficiency you want is when you need the heat from it, when it's the coldest outside, and you're not going to get 300%. Because I've operated a couple. But that, that's a seasonal performance factor, not that's an instantaneous, yeah. It's not when you need it. No. And when also, they have trace heating. So when they get an ice block on them, which they inevitably do during the winter months, you're then using it raw electricity to melt the ice off to then you put ice back on to get heating to the room. Uh, up to about 120 kilowatts, they reverse cycle now. They reverse the valve and defrost that way. And but the you other argument for the ground source is not only can you use it for heating in the winter, but you can then reverse it and use it for cooling in the summer. 
I've got some more slides on, on, but yes, ground source heat pumps, you get two sides of the equation. You get both the heating and the cooling, which is a massive benefit. Any other questions? Every engineer that designs a system adds their 10%. Um, traditional heating systems were sized for 72 degrees C flow temperature, and they're designed to heat a room up from cold, 12 degrees, to occupancy, 21, within 30 minutes. With a heat pump, we use weather compensation, and you heat 24-7. So you're, you're treating it like a super tanker. Once you've got that building up to temperature, it's now all thermal mass. So you don't have that heating up, cooling down. You get it going, you turn a heat pump on in September, and it ticks along, varying the flow temperature into the radiators or the heat emitters based on what's happening outside. So once the building's up to temperature, you've got thermal mass, it just ticks along. So actually, I, I've done it on my own property where I took all the radiators, I went through all the U-values, did windows, doors, and sized both radiators for 72 degrees C on oil and for weather compensation on heat pumps. And they're only 10% bigger to get a 45 degree C flow temperature on a heat pump to do the same as you would with 72 degrees C out of a boiler to heat a room up from cold. So um, in theory, yes, in practice, if you look at the whole picture, no, you don't need to. And a lot of, um, in 2007, I converted a stately home, which had uh, large cast iron radiators covered in wood. So they just tried to insulate their heat emitter. Um, it's grade one listed, couldn't touch the inside at all. Uh, it was designed for 95 degrees C flow temperature through large flow pipes, big cast iron radiators. Put a heat pump on there with weather compensation. His um, oil bill is £25,000 a year. Um, oil bill went down to zero and he, his comment was, well now my heat's for free, let's turn it up. So it's a 1,600 square metre mansion, two people living in it, heated to 23 degrees C all year round through an existing system that we didn't touch. So. Um, Existing systems are over-designed. Plumbers go into a room, see a window, and goes, that radiator will fit. Simple as that. There's no design in it. Design probably went out in the 70s when there were heating engineers. Now it's just plumbers that go on a condensing gas boiler course and measure a window to fit a radiator under. Pipe sizing, all of that's gone out the window. Any? 30 watts per metre squared is the basis they use. 30 watts per metre squared is the basis they use. 100. If you ask a plumber, he'll do the area of a room, he'll say 100 watts a metre squared. And there's his margin. It's probably 300% safety factor. And he walks away and says, my client's never cold. Sleep at night. Yes, exactly. But he's in a, in a house that's 100 square metres, average three-bedroom house, it's got a heat load of about 8 kilowatts. Standard fits a 30 kilowatt boiler. So that boiler's cycling on and off, although gas modulates quite a bit. Yeah. Sorry, behind you. Yeah. I think one of, uh, one of the obstacles for heat pumps, um, like I, I worked in the, uh, at, at an engineering consultancy, and the people who I worked with who were senior engineers and principal engineers, they, would not like, they didn't like touching heat pumps because they didn't really understand how they worked. All, all they knew was that it upgraded heat, um, low grade heat from outside into inside, but because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't burning something which is very easy to understand. I know that they weren't very competent in it. And if they weren't, I know there's lots in the industry who would say, actually, you don't want to go for air source, you want to go for environment. It wasn't Hawley, was it? No, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> they they have, or have had that issue. From Are you prepared to say who it was? That'd be interesting. I mean, it was um, Ramble. UK. Yes, okay. I've dealt, with, I've dealt with Ramble in the early days in the London office. Is that where you were? Uh, no, I was, I was here in Leeds. Okay, no, the London office had a similar attitude. But it, it's older engineers who are not... It's safety margin, you know, radiators three times the size, everything's over spec If you go to a large consultancy to uh, install your domestic heating system, you will pay four times what you need to and end up with more than you... Because it's safety margin, they don't... They have um, uh, public liability insurance, and if they get it wrong their premiums go up and they lose their name, so they over-specify everything. 
but yes, I agree. They um, don't understand. Um, yeah, just on that point, I don't know if you have a slide explaining how heat pumps do work. I've got heat pumps after biomass. We're sort of jumping the gun a bit. 